I, I regret about everything about my life. I was one of the worst people imaginable. Well, then, everything about this sucks for me. He's dead, everyone! Hooray! Hello, and welcome to The Conversation. I'm Heil Russell. And I'm Cameron Regal. And yes, uh, we have just witnessed the death of awful Abe here on The Conversation. Uh, should we send a fruit basket or something? I don't... I don't really know what the protocol is when the, the heinous person you signed a lifetime contract with to open your podcast about Donkey Kong and, and related shenanigans dies on a remote tropical island somewhere in the South Pacific. I don't know what you do when that happens. Uh, and I feel like it's probably tasteless to cheer when when it happens. Um, but uh, I guess we need to start looking for a replacement or something. Um, what, what do you think, Cameron? Um, I don't know. I mean, you start off with the uh, high energy intros as it is. M- maybe some some new talent will will send in a demo tape in the next couple of days, or you know, maybe maybe we're just gonna stay with his body. I don't know how this works. How this lifetime contract I signed works. Maybe we'll we'll hear, hear him decomposing for the next several. I months. absolutely insist that is is a literal demo tape. You, you got to get that thing in reel to reel and send it to us. Wave wave files and MP threes need not apply. No, we we are running on some archaic equipment here at DK Vine. But uh, we'll find out what happens. Stay tuned, I guess. He's dead, but you know, who who knows where this crazy story is going to go? I surely don't. Why would I? I'm not the one screaming it. Here we are on the conversation. Before we get started, I do have a correction to make from uh the last episode. So, uh, I mentioned, when we were talking about DKU Revelations last time, I made a reference to Nick Prohl's feature on DK Vine called The Jinx, and I I said that Cranky murdered Wrinkly, uh, that that was the crux of the feature. Well, he, it's not exactly how it goes, and I, I misspoke, and I apologize. I apologize to Nick Prohl. I apologize to all of the people who have been falsely accused of murdering their wife. Like Harrison Ford in The Fugitive and the the guy who starred in the TV show The Fugitive. Uh, all those people. I apologize. So, uh, yeah, read the feature to find out what exactly happens. My bad. I'm sorry. I feel terrible. I, I haven't been able to get any sleep. Since I made that mistake, I, I've just been walking around, my head slumped, my, my shoulder slumped, my back slumped. I, I'm in desperate need of a chiropractor, but I might just have Cameron step on my back later in the episode to, to make it right. Would, would you want to do that, Cameron? Would you want to step on my back, please? You didn't have to ask, but... I, sure. I, I know, but, you know, it, it's weird. I, I, I am addicted to YouTube videos of people getting their, their joints cracked in various ways and um my my dream in life is to be rolfed is that where you have a dog play the piano i don't know if that's uh what it entails but it it supposedly it it adds several inches to your posture and i i am a man who just said he needs several inches added to it (laughs) so why don't we just move on uh to our due diligence before we get to the topic of this episode which uh, is one big correction, I suppose, in uh, the Donkey Kong game that was briefly in development for the Virtual Boy. So uh, we'll, we'll be getting into that. But uh, due diligence, really quick. Just from, from the outset here, I want to mention we've got lots of great conversations on the way, Cameron. So, so after this episode, I, I'm going to try to hit a roughly weekly schedule for the next several weeks as we rattle these off one by one. So we've got uh, next week, we're going to be talking, Jeff Onan and I are going to be talking about the one-year anniversary of Sea of Thieves, including everything that was added to the game with Shrouded Spoils and everything that's coming to the game that we'll soon find out with the so-called Mega Update. 
So one year of Sea of Thieves, Jeff and I will be talking about that next week. Speaking of Sea of Thieves, you and I also needed to have a literary analysis, Cameron, about Chris Alcock's book, Athena's Fortune. I, I can't believe we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, we, we will be getting into the nitty gritty for that book. Uh, on the other side of the uh, rare platonic divide, we'll be talking about all the revelations recently uncovered by the ukulele developer commentaries on YouTube. And uh, it's been very fascinating there. And it's my love for ukulele has kind of doubled or, or maybe even doubled and a half. Just finding out why certain decisions were made in, in making that game ha- has made me appreciate it all the more. So we'll be getting into that. And also, we need to discuss Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Finally, finally, we will be discussing that. And you know why we'll be discussing that, Cameron? No. Yes, you do. (laughs) It's because uh, the U.S. has finally gotten a physical release for the so-called gold edition of the game. So back in last summer, it was revealed that when Donkey Kong Adventure came out, Europe would be getting this physical edition called the gold edition which would come bundled with the uh download code for the season pass that would give you donkey kong adventure but also donkey kong's face was on this cover and so i said well hey i've got to get this gold edition because this as as a dku completionist this is the version of the game i need to buy right i mean it, it has to be so uh I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and we got no news on the Gold Edition here in North America. So, inevitably, I just thought, it's not coming, but then that means I have to buy the next best edition of the game. And in my twisted worldview, the next best edition would be the Collector's Edition they released when the game came out. I believe it came with a a rabid statue and... Uh, various other sundries. It went for well over $100 on eBay at this point, so... I was like, well, huh. being a, a cash-strapped individual with a smaller-than-small business uh, that doesn't even register as a business by most metrics, I I will have to really uh, budget my money to, to get this. And, and then YouTube demonetized us. So uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Uh, well, maybe I should just buy the standard edition, review it for DK Vine at long last, and then when I have the funds plunked down for the collector's edition which by that point will probably go for 200 or 300 dollars on ebay but uh it's now available in the u.s not with donkey kong's face on the cover but it does have the donkey kong logo on the cover which still by my metrics is the best edition of the game but you can only get it at costco and luckily my mother-in-law has a costco membership so i will have to log on to the website using her credentials and without letting her know that her daughter married such a complete fucking she already knows she already knows she she married a weirdo she gave me donkey kong pillow cases uh two christmases ago so she she knows and she supports it or at least on face value she supports it so yeah cameron uh this is good news for you because you've also been waiting out for the gold edition right yeah yeah it's it's a really good thing that like three days before this announcement i didn't uh assume that a gold edition was never coming and buy the physical copy of the game that doesn't include the season pass on sale and then immediately wrap it unwrap it so i couldn't return it yeah thank goodness i definitely did not do that well it just shows that would be really stupid and make me feel awful for uh waiting over a year to play the game yeah well it it just goes to show cameron that at the end of the day it, it doesn't pay to be a Rodney the Hare. It pays to be a Tip Top the Turtle. So long as you're there to bail me out when they strap me to TNT. Exactly. Um, wait, what? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was mad. I was okay. I was picturing the imp from Conker's Bad Fur Day who had the TNT barrel strapped to his back. That's what I was picturing. No, it, it's weird. D, DK64, like, Rodney is one of the more insufferable non-playable characters that you can run into but also that happens to him yeah i i completely which, blacked so out i should have a little bit of sympathy i completely blacked out on the, on that plot point anyway uh support dk vine on patreon then we got all these conversations coming up don't you want to listen to them live as they happen i know i would 
because I'm the one recording them, so I kind of have to. But maybe you do too. So support us on Patreon. $5 and up lets you listen to the conversation live. And I want to give a shout out right now to our live stream. Hello, live stream. How you doing? Hi, Andre. And, and other people who aren't talking. Hello, Andre. How you doing? Good, good, good to see you. Uh, but yeah, you can interact with us as we record live. And also get conversations a day early, as well as other content for $2 and up. $1 and up, just $1 a month, get you the DK Vine stickers. And those are going out right now to the patrons. The 2019 Series 4 of the DK Vine sticker collection. We got K Crazy Croco, we've got Marth's Nine the Goldfish, and we've got Crystal with a C and an I. So... Unique characters who are in no way related to beloved Donkey Kong Universe characters. I don't even know why we're giving out these stickers if there's no relation, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. DKVine.com slash Patreon. Uh, don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, even when Facebook wasn't working this week, I still got a Facebook post up. I was able to sneak in. I got one under the sliding door and uh, my, my streak is intact. Daily updates on Facebook and Twitter. If you like Donkey Kong, if you like the shared Donkey Kong universe, including Banjo and Conker, various other games, uh, maybe even Sea of Thieves somehow, uh, Ukulele, you know, if you like Rare Platonic, follow us! Follow us, like us, whatever you have to do, and we'll show up in your feed. And it's content. It's Donkey Kong universe-related content every day. You can't escape from it, so please follow us. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, I guess, although I'm going to start calling it BooTube because uh, we are still in the midst of our demonetization crisis, and uh, it, it's just been, it's been, a, been a struggle, Cameron, but you know what? We will persevere. We will win out in the end over, over the Google algorithms and uh, we will get that sorted. So subscribe to us on BooTube. Uh, maybe I should make a new redirect there. DKVine.com slash BooTube. Maybe I should. And maybe I will. I think I will. This is still going on by October. It can be retroactive Halloween branding. I can repurpose that redirect in October for a Halloween-centric video. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, DKVine Forum. Uh, never been a better time to join. DKVine.com slash forum we got lots of fun activities going on in the forum right now thanks to our uh, iron fingers our, our moderators and uh they they've, they're engaging the community and and having all sorts of uh, wacky shenanigans like like amiibo fantasy football con- con- contest i i don't i don't know i don't know i don't understand it but but they're having a good time you can check that out and participate dkvine.com slash form and don't forget if you listen to the conversation but you want to call in and hear your voice on the conversation that prestigious honor uh call us dkvine hotline 1202630 vine that's 8463 call us anytime seriously leave us a message and we'll play it eventually uh it doesn't have to be related to that week's episode We'll save those for the eventual all-purpose call sack episodes, but you know, uh, just just do it. What, you, what what do you have to lose? What do they have to lose? Can't, I don't understand what they think they have to lose besides their dignity, and and perhaps future employment prospects. But besides that, who cares? Who cares? Anyway, yeah. Don't forget, we're trying to get Nintendo President Chantaro Furukawa on the conversation for our. Big spotlight episode for Mario Golf Game Boy Color this October. So when dkvine.com slash BooTube redirects to something spooky, we're going to be we're hopefully chatting it up with, with a Nintendo president talking about Mario Golf for the Game Boy Color. Since he's a big golf RPG fan, I, I figure this will be the perfect time to get him on. But I'm not seeing much groundswell of support for this, and that disappoints me. So people, please... Take to the streets with the signs and, and, and the chanting that we want Shintaro Furukawa on the conversation for the big spotlight episode for Mario Golf Game Boy Color this October. Rolls off the top. Bring lots of water. Yeah. Ro- lots of water. Lots of water. Lo- lots of uh, towels because you will be sweating up a storm chanting that. But you know what? Perseverance, people. I, I want to see it happen. We, we need 
We need we need, we need the grassroots support for this because it's not going to happen if I do it. Because there's conspiracy against DK Vine. It goes all the way up to the YouTube algorithm. And I'm sure it goes even higher than that. Moscow, you know, has it out for us. We've established that. So it's not going to happen unless the power of the people make it so. So I, I'm adamant about this. But, you know, the power of the people is impressive, Cameron. But so far it is failed to uncover the missing episode of The Conversation Season 6. I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. The clues are laid out in Season 6. Really, a- any any mildly on-the-ball detective would have figured it out by now. Like, not even Sherlock. Holmes would have figured it out right by now. Robin would have figured it out right now. Like, like not even, like, Dick Grayson Robin. Jason Todd Robin would have figured it out by now. I, I just don't understand why nobody's figured it out. But the first... I, I feel like... I feel like Batman wouldn't even bother trying to figure it out. He'd just come to your house and hold you by the neck until you told him where it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. When people say Batman's the world's greatest detective, they, they fail to take that into account that to get most of his clues, he just holds people upside down atop gargoyles. I'm like, well, yeah, sure, you can say you're the world's greatest detective when you when that's like your biggest tool of the trade, but... Oh, 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 I have a supercomputer, so I'm going to trace these bullet fragments. Also, I'm going to go beat up desperate men who are just trying to eke by a living in our society that that rewards the super rich or well-connected and nobody but. Oh, you know, it's this this whole college uh, admission scandal. I've lost a lot of uh, the respect I had for Becky Tanner, I have to tell you. And, and, you know, it chafes my hide as somebody who... Who has to battle to get their channel monetized on YouTube. No thank you, Cameron. And what does this have to do with Batman or the missing conversation episode? I don't know. The world sucks right now, Cameron. That could be what the missing episode is it about. Could be. You'll never know you unless you find you, it. You don't know unless you, you hold somebody over a gargoyle and threaten to beat it out of them. So I want to see more of that. While you're petitioning the Nintendo president... Hold people over gargoyles. I can't even talk. I'm so worked up by this, Cameron. (sighs) Also take to the also take to the streets and ask people to bring back gargoyles. Really, it's really really hard to hang people from gargoyles when modern architecture just hasn't embraced the gargoyle like it used to. That's that's true. But you know what? The first person who successfully holds somebody over a recently brought back gargoyle and finds where the missing episode of The Conversation Season 6 is, gets an autographed copy of Sea of Thieves number 1 comic book. And while you're bringing back the gargoyles, don't forget to also hashtag bring back the spiders. All right. All right, Cameron. Here we go. Uh, you know, <laughs> that that was a very passionate due diligence, and uh, I, I apologize I got so worked up there. Uh, I, I, I'm feeling euphoric right now, though, despite all the, the drama with YouTube, I suppose I should also discuss the recent drama I've had with E3, and I've not, not brought this up on air thus far, but, uh, so, E3 media, uh, registration was opened a couple weeks ago, and first day, you know, I, I did it, as I'm wont to do, and for the past few years we've uh, i've gotten in on a e3 media pass because believe it or not dk vine is big enough to warrant an e3 media pass and so you know i i did it as i as i always do and and then uh, i got an email back a couple weeks later and said uh you've you've been denied you've you've been rejected uh you're you're not big enough to get an e3 media pass and that sent me on a downward spiral, I have to admit. But between that and the YouTube uh, battles uh, I've been having, I just felt like, wow, DK Vine's going to shit under under my my leadership. I I am I am a pathetic hack fraud, and this is just a nightmare. I can't go to E3 now, and I can't provide the coverage that I want to c- provide for our audience. And, oh, God, what was me? I bought out, went out and bought a big bottle of rum, and I drank it really quickly. And it, it, was, it was a dark time in, in House DK Vine. But uh, then then last week they sent me an email. Because I sent them an email, and I said, well, what? 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 Because, hey, I, I, I've gotten in all other years, and uh, looking at our metrics, there's no reason why I shouldn't be getting in. 
did you did you raise the bar like what what happened and then they got back to me and they said our bad you're in and, and I was, oh okay well that was nine days of anxiety and depression and sleepless nights and just despondent fugue states for nothing but oh, okay thank you so hey cameron dk vine's gonna be at e3 this year yeah yeah dk vine's gonna be at e3 it's gonna be a great e3 we'll be talking about that in the weeks to come, but uh, we will be providing you uh, just relentless coverage at E3 of everything related to the Donkey Kong universe, rare or platonic. We're, we're going to be just like laser focused. You're going to have those those daily or rather nightly conversations. You're, you're going to be having just wall to wall coverage on social media, YouTube videos, even even if they're not monetized, they're still going to be there. It's it's going to be a huge E3 for us, so don't miss it. And anyway, uh, let's let's talk about the crux of this episode, Cameron. This is a poor segue, but I don't care. So, this is actually a follow up appointment to a season three conversation episode we did August two thousand fifteen. So on episode three three five of the conversation. Chad and I discussed the ever-so-briefly in-development Donkey Kong game for the Virtual Boy, which, at the time, we believed was Donkey Kong Country 2, or rather, a version of Donkey Kong Country 2 for the Virtual Boy. For the longest time, we were operating under the assumption that the Donkey Kong game that Rare was briefly working on for the Virtual Boy was a, a remake or a concurrent port of Donkey Kong Country 2. And this was all due to what Lee Loveday told us back in 2001 in the Classic Scribes letter column. And so so I'm not crazy here Cameron, right? Like this is this is actually documented in Scribes. I didn't just imagine this, right? No, this is absolutely all here in blue and also blue because that was the the way Scribes was laid out. It's it's amazing um, that blue text on blue background actually worked as a color scheme it, it, it's soothing <laughs> it's honestly. very soothing, very very calm very passive i think it made uh lee's like barbs and insults a, a lot more uh palatable uh, when when it was bathed in baby blue because it was like oh well how j- I was gently put down by him so i i can't get mad like there's no way he'd get away with half that content nowadays but uh yeah may- maybe more people just need to try the blue on blue like maybe politicians need to try it and maybe like that's that's what we need to put twitter on like just a blue on blue color scheme uh because maybe then we wouldn't just be yelling at each other so much on social media i don't know but yeah uh l- you uh helpfully retrieved the relevant tweets and they're both from 2000 not tweets excuse me i i'm thinking in 2019 terminology uh scribe answers uh responses i i don't even know how to how to Man, we're, qualify th- this anymore this is so long ago we're 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 getting so old we're going to have to explain the concept of scribes aren't what we? is a letters column cameron explain this to me Scribes used to be a section on Rare's official website, usually referred to as Rareware. Back in the day, um, back in the day, because that was a pun, because Rareware, it, Rareware is what they used to call Rare colloquially on the games, if not the act, what the actual name of the studio was, but it's how a lot of Nintendo fans still refer to the studio today, Rareware, like Rare Software. But As I understand, it was like a branding decision to mostly to like specifically denote their software the company entity was still rare in legalese as you know rare limited right 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 but um they 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 went to the rare wear branding i believe with uh killer instinct and donkey kong country and uh so that was like the debut of that classic logo and i think exited it around i want to say ghoulies yeah so i believe the last game to actually bear that logo was grunny's revenge maybe um, I, I believe Ghoulies was the debut of the, um, just the shortened Rare logo, which they had until Connect Sports when they introduced the, the logo nobody liked. And then that was up until Rare Replay when they introduced the modern logo, which is kind of a hybrid of the Rare Wear logo and the, uh, 
early Xbox era rare logos but that's a tangent the best logo they've ever had i think uh, it definitely is like i as much fondness as i have for the classic rare wear logo i kind of like this logo even more because it, it utilizes the best of, of all of the rare logos and it also isn't doesn't say rare wear which is very confusing for people and i kind of grit my teeth whenever people refer to it unknowingly as rare wear today like, I don't, I don't yeah, mind people, people celebrating well, people that. will do it as, like, a... I don't care for it sometimes because people will purposely refer to them as rare wear to make a distinction between rare as it existed before 2002 and how rare as it exists now. Right, and, and I don't mind if people use it in a nostalgic sense but still, like, have no qualms about modern-day rare, but there is certain uh, sometimes a sense of, like, rare wear is the true rare when it was never actually called rare wear. But anyway, anyway, anyway. But yeah, yeah, so Rare Wear was their website, Rare, W-H-E-R-E. Uh, you know, pun. And uh, yeah, this was a page that hosted um, emails that people would send in to Rare that were then the, um, answered by Lee Loveday and posted publicly to the page. This is where the cult of Lee Loveday really uh, comes from is Scribes. And, well, the whole Rare website, but Scribes was basically the heart and soul of it because that's what we all waited for. We all waited for a Scribes update because not only was it just him answering letters and our chance to interact with somebody who actually works at Rare, which pre-social media was just unheard of, but this was also where we would find out out a lot of juicy information that would never be released otherwise we're like never anywhere else on rare's website never in press releases we could find out information about sometimes games that weren't even out yet like this is where it was essentially soft confirm that they were working on Donkey Kong 64 months before they were actually ready to make that announcement uh, but you would also find out behind the scenes stuff and also sometimes info about games that never were, such as maybe what they were working for on the Virtual Boy. And um, yeah, so there in 2001, May and August, there were two different uh, emails sent to Scribes that both brought up the topic of a game for the Virtual Boy that Rare had been working on. And... Uh, the one from May was a little cagier, like Lee didn't really get into the specifics. He danced around what they were actually working on. And then he just came out and said it in the August one. So uh, do you, you want to read? I'll give you the honor. Specifically to spite the guy in the letter for guessing what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> do you want to read Lee's responses to one Adam Murray in May and, uh, oh God, Fairy... F fairy Gro Groning I I can't read Norse <laughs> names. Groningic. Groning okay, yeah. It, it 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 the first part is spelled like Matt Groening from off of The Simpsons. It, it, if it hasn't been a name in a Thor movie, I don't know how to pronounce it. So so just the responses then. Well, I mean, I do, do you want to read the whole letter? I I don't. Maybe, maybe we should just for like the to give people the context of the kind of things people were asking about in sure. 2001. Sure, sure, sure. So remember, 2001, this was still uh well over a year before the buyout. So this was still this was post Conquer's Bad Fur Day, but still in the era where Rare and Nintendo were basically viewed as inseparable entities, right? A little bit of context there. So people are are Asking questions about the Virtual Boy, but it's not unheard of or weird uh, or, or just like being annoyingly persistent about their relationship with Nintendo. It still existed at this time. Hence, people asking about it. Yeah, there, there's an archive of all of this, by the way, at the site uh, rareware with an H dot neocities dot org. Neocities, um, not geocities, because geocities also doesn't exist anymore. Right. So uh, start at the top. Dear Rare Space Wear, it has come to my attention that you developed and produced, yet never re released, a GoldenEye 007 game for the Virtual Boy. I'm aware that most companies keep things like that around for such occasions, as if maybe the system is re-released or other such needs. I'm also aware that it was a driving game unlike the FPS that you made for the 64. 
I would like to find out if it is possible for me to acquire one of these games. I know you must get these questions all the time. However, I feel that my request differs from all the others in that I don't want to get this game to sit it on a shelf or sell it like so many others would. I would like this for what it was originally intended for, to play and enjoy. I feel that (laughs) since it was stamped with your company name on it, that it must have been a great game. I have GoldenEye for 64 and Banjo-Kazooie and other Rare games and have become a great fan of Rare, especially your depiction of Bond. I am willing to pay you for the game if it is accessible. I don't need anything fancy like the retail package, as there probably wasn't one. But if you would be so kind as to grant me this one request, I would be appreciative. From one game player to another, I don't think that the hard work that went into this game should go to waste. It should be enjoyed by the masses. Sincerely, Adam Murray. Oh, wow. I I love that. Please, please sell me this unreleased game. (laughs) Unlike all the other people who write into your web page, I would play and enjoy your game rather than selling it for a profit. Right, right, yes, yes. <laughs> Please sell me the, the uh, this unreleased game featuring the James Bond license. It, like no, we we are throwing stones in the glass house, by the way, because we did write into this column as teenagers. Oh yeah, look, I'm I'm embarrassed by at least half my letters uh, to scribes, but. Now I'm sure I I have much more humiliating stuff in there, but uh and uh in the live stream chat, Andre says uh he's a little surprised there hasn't been a multi-part dedicated scribes retrospective episode yet, given how large its shadow still looms. I think that will be coming, uh, Andre. I I think we'll definitely have that maybe later this year. I. I feel like we need an Oops All Tangents episode about Uncle Tusk. Yeah, we might just have a whole episode or multi-part episode dedicated to rare wear in general. Um, but it, like, I feel like we couldn't even do that without getting Lee Loveday's input. It would almost seem like in poor taste. I don't know. Like, it, it's it, it's it's definitely a project I've considered, but it seems so daunting even for our standards that. I, I've put it off, but given this is the 20th anniversary of DK Vine this year, and so much of DK Vine was basically taking the sensibilities of Rareware and just like amplifying them uh, to just this insane degree, and much more hollow and less uh, authentic than uh, Rareware ever was. Uh, I think this would be a good season to do such a retrospective. But uh, I'll go ahead and read uh, this response from Lee. Yes. Um, represented on Scribes, by the way. He didn't answer these like signed Lee or anything. It's represented by a the, the Rareware logo with a colon next to it. So uh, to a lot of us, this was just Rare speaking to you directly. Lee was the voice of Rare. First time I discovered Rareware was at Elliot's house because he had uh, the internet before I did. And we were looking for answers about what would then what would eventually become known as Stop and Swap because we had just gotten to that part in Banjo. And we were like, we were like, we did not believe we had to wait till the sequel. Like, surely there, there, there must be more to this. So we were like trolling Rare's website looking for answers, and we just like spent hours reading everything. And it, I, I like s- sussed out some comment he made that he was L Love Day, who we'd seen in the credits for so many games. And so I was like, oh my god, L Love Day, he's the one <laughs> doing this uh, website. Uh, so we knew it was Lee. We just, yeah, it was never presented like I am Lee Loveday. This, this is, um, this is my opinion, but it was an open secret. He was the one writing it anyway. Sorry. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and read these words here. Wow. A brand new rumor. I'm almost excited. Out of curiosity, where did you get this information? Sorry to disappoint you, but it's the first we've heard of it. The only 007 racing game that we know of is the recent PlayStation effort. We've certainly never worked on one ourselves. As it happens, we did have a Virtual Boy game in development at one stage, but I'm not going to tell you what it was, partly because I don't know if I'm allowed to, and partly because it will amuse me to keep you in suspense. I know, based on that, I I definitely sent in an email at some point, like, trying trying to get more info out of them, and, and... Granted, I, I was basically, I, I sent several emails every month to scribes, and I, I think I only missed like one or two letter columns in a, in a multi-year streak. Um, but I, 
he i don't believe he ever used my queries about what this game was can i just say like to lee's like absolute credit on this back in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s like in an era where like it's become a thing where brands are trying really hard and falling really really hard on their own faces trying to put a personality to their like corporate brand lee had them all beat at this game in when he was doing this for rare like everybody's just chasing his shadow yeah it it really was unheard of to have this corporate website have so much snark and personality like people go on and on about like the wendy's twitter account and stuff but man i mean that's what rareware was back then and it really i think cemented i mean i was already like a rare diehard by the time i found it but it really like the the comparison between that website and nintendo's website you know i mean it it, it basically summed up the two perspectives and if you sub- subscribe to this kind of no no pun intended there with the word scribe in there um if you subscribe to this cer- mentality or humor or cheekiness um like you were a rare fan and i'm not saying like you can be a nintendo diehard and and have that sense of humor but it it just yeah there was a stark difference between rare and nintendo and we viewed rare like on equal grounds with nintendo which was weird you know but yeah back then they were just like viewed as rare rare develops games for nintendo but their like shadow looms so large over nintendo that um it, it was just like they were viewed as basically this equal entity that could they could very easily just come out with their own console and we wouldn't have blinked. It would have just been, oh yeah, well finally, what took you so long? You know, finally Rare just spins out on its own and and becomes like the new Sega or whatever. Um, that, that's that's what it felt like at the time. That that basically launched uh, speculation throughout that summer of 2001 about, you know, what the Virtual Boy Rare game was. And, you know, I, I think it was pretty much assume that it was probably a donkey kong game just because that would have made the most sense and that would have been the cash cow if you if you had to strain your brain to think mid 90s rare 3d and you're just trying to think of the first pre-existing name that comes to you it's it's gonna be donkey Kong. yeah like i could have seen a killer instinct game for it i could i could have seen you know even an original ip but i think donkey kong was viewed as the cash cow more than any and probably the easiest game killer instinct would have also required multiplayer true yeah although you know they still had a game boy game and i i don't know many people who had that game link cable so once pokemon came yeah this out, was pre-pokemon though this, this was you yeah. know this was still like brick game boy era what we're talking about here so it, it was probably it wasn't even at the time, it was never about um, having a difficult, for me, having a difficult time finding somebody with a link cable. It was having a difficult time finding somebody with the same exact game as you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The the things we had to go through for portable multiplayer back then, it, it seems so funny now in the era where we have a Switch and it's just, uh, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy, just a click of a button and play with anybody worldwide. But, um... A mere 12 days before our two-year anniversary, it was revealed um, what um, the game actually was. So, Cameron, would you want to read this letter from the Netherlands? Sure. This is uh, from August 10th, 2001. Um, The header image um, at this time was a shark claw from off of Star Fox Adventures um, because they would rotate which characters and things were in the site banner on the scribes page um okay dear scribes in reply to your response to adam murray's letter i'm afraid i'm probably to blame for that rumor as i posted you as the developer of the virtual boy unreleased golden i 007 game on my website www.virtual uh boy.net A while back, along with a big scan of an in-game screenshot from an official Nintendo brochure, it seemed only logical, as I thought Rare owned the GoldenEye license to making games of it in 1995. Any idea who did it if not you? 
Oh, and why are you not allowed to say Virtual Boy Donkey Kong Country was in development? I realize not much code could have been finished in a few weeks' work, but I also heard a designer had been been at work on the game. Is there any chance you'd be able to give out some artwork from the unreleased game? New Virtual Boy info is pretty hard to come by these days, you know. Faithfully yours, Fairy Green Injic from the Netherlands. P.S. The picture of GoldenEye 007 I scanned is pretty big, so I will just link you to it. And it is a link of a... Basically, just a, it looks like a Mode 7 driving game with a James Bond car, and I, I want to say, like, aerial drones... Yeah, that sounds terrible. Like I get, like I get, kind of like a like a Mode Seven Spy Hunter vibe looking at this, mm-hmm. like just from a cursory glance. Which seems like weird because Goldeneye is like the one Bond movie that doesn't have like a cool car scene. It has the tank because it, it got replaced with the tank. Yeah, it yeah, got yeah. replaced with the tank. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, I do remember this website though. I know we uh, DK Vine had some interaction with them and i believe we were even linked on their website at one time um just being one of the few virtual boy allies <laughs> that could be found online i fondly remember this website of his so uh it takes me back uh so so lee did respond to that and uh would you would you like to read his response now yes you're not joking about it being quote unquote pretty big No idea who was working on VB Goldeneye, but rest assured it wasn't us. Interesting take on it, though. Looks a bit like Chase HQ. And it wasn't Donkey Kong Country. It was Donkey Kong Country 2. It didn't get very far. I used to share a house with the bloke who was doing the title screen, though that's probably not the earth-shattering exclusive you were hoping for. Again, as a little sign of the times thing, when I said quote-unquote, I meant like he actually typed out pretty big in quotes. Like, I think being sincere... This the resolution on this image is five ninety six by three three hundred and one. <laughs> right, yeah, uh, but but that that was pretty big at the time. The time of dial up that was uh, that was a huge image. It, it probably is like one, not even like not even a twelfth of my screen. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. So yeah. He he said that. Uh, he, he used to share a house with a bloke who was doing the title screen and somewhere along the way, maybe just through hazy recollection, the bloke who was doing the title screen morphed into all that was finished for the game was the title screen. Like, like that's all the work that had been put into it before it was abandoned. I think maybe in my child brain, if I had read that, I would have thought like, oh, well, logically they start game development on the title screen. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know what I was thinking there, but yeah, eventually that morphed into like the common knowledge that, oh yeah, yeah, they were working on Donkey Kong Country 2 for the Virtual Boy, but they just got the title screen done and, and then they realized the Virtual Boy wasn't a success, so they stopped uh, development on it. And, and you know, the, the, the timeline of Donkey Kong Country 2 being made for the Virtual Boy did kind of make the most sense if you were to stop and examine when it would have been in development because uh, the Virtual Boy was launched in Japan in July of 1995 and then the following month in North America. So by the time the system was out, Donkey Kong Land, the first one, had already uh, made it out the door and the bulk of the original Donkey Kong Country team were already deep into developing Donkey Kong Country 2, which was already announced and shown at E3 that year, the very first E3. So so Lee's recollection in August 2001 seemed logical to us that, oh yeah, it would have been Donkey Kong Country 2 because that's the game that that's pre-release lined up with the Virtual Boy. And we're not saying, I, I've seen this bandied about online that, Donkey Kong Country 2 was originally developed exclusively for the Virtual Boy. That's nonsense. That 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 would would have never been the case. Of course, it was being developed for the Super Nintendo. This would have been a parallel, uh, like n- n- no relation to the Bird, a parallel development. I feel like there's no way the game would have come out like in a year's time following the first if they had started on the Virtual Boy, had to throw everything out, and then 
go to the snap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, like the thinking here, based on Lee's comment, was that it was going. It was basically somebody was taking the assets they were developing for Donkey Kong Country Two and turning that into a separate game, kind of like a Donkey Kong Land Two before Donkey Kong Land Two was ever made. Um, which like a parallel port, right? Which doesn't even. which doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. But hey, Lee said it was Donkey Kong Country Two, so. You know, we, we viewed that as word of God, gospel, it, it, that, that's it. And and so for for the next uh, nearly uh, 18 years, that is what I believed. And uh, be- before we get into my worldview being shattered, uh, I, I want to give some thoughts on the Virtual Boy and this whole era of Nintendo, uh, I- if I can. And I know I went into this. Uh, on our season three episode I did with Chad, but I, I, you know, I don't get a whole lot of opportunities to really talk about the virtual boy for an entire episode of the conversation. So I'm going to use this chance, Cameron, because, you know, you know, I love the virtual boy, right? Wa- wa- wax that nostalgia. I'm going to wax wa- it. Wax it. I want, I want to see my face in that nostalgia. It's going to be, it's going to be so, it's going to be waxed so hard you can open a Yankee candle store in it, Cameron. Summer 1995. Through the winter of early 96, I think that is the era of gaming that I will always view with the most fondness. That's not to say, like, there won't be games that come out that that I don't adore or hold, you know, near the very tip-top or tip-top of my, my favorites list. Like, Sea of Thieves, it, it, I now consider that my top four games of all time. And I've had some of the most fun I've ever had playing video games, playing that game. But... You know, when, when I think back to my childhood and the most magical, nostalgic moments in gaming, it, it would have to be these months, summer 95 through early 96. Um, you know, that that was when I was entering middle school, which I hated, but I, I had this refuge in gaming and I finally had my video game series. The video game series I identified with more than any other, Donkey Kong Country. Like, like when Donkey Kong Country came out, I, I was a gamer before then. You know, I, I'd played, I, I was a Nintendo kid. I, you know, I loved Super Mario. I you know, had all of these games. But when Donkey Kong Country came out, I was like, oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. Nothing else matters at this point. This, this appeals to so many aspects of who I am and would go on to inform so much of who I would become. And so so I had Donkey Kong Country. Donkey Kong Land had just come out, which kind of boosted my fandom of this series because now I had this portable game that added so much to the world and to the lore and I could take it on the go. And I, <sighs> Donkey Kong Country 2 was just announced. So I had this to look forward to. This, this this sequel to my favorite game of all time. And, and meanwhile, Nintendo was just killing it in general, in my opinion. Like, the Super Nintendo was on top, and thanks to DKC, was now the undisputed king of the 16-bit console wars. The Super Game Boy was out, and that made playing Game Boy games uh, an enjoyable experience for really the first time ever, because you could play it on your TV, you could see it in crystal clarity, you no longer had to squint or get just the right lighting or one of those stupid book lights on your Game Boy. No, you could actually sit down and enjoy a Game Boy game uh, on its own merits. So that was great. The Nintendo Ultra 64, we knew that was arriving at some point in the next year. And with, with that... Killer Instinct told us so. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, Killer Instinct promised it a little bit sooner. But, I mean, by the summer mm-hmm. of 95, that... that trajectory was on point about a year you know about a year uh, yeah with the nintendo ultra 64 as we knew it at the time you know we we had all sorts of crazy grandeur associated and dreamed up with it and uh you know it of course wasn't imp- as impressive as the hype or our, our own fantasies uh, w- would have it but it was you know eventually it was it was still a damn cool system and we also uh, had the Virtual Boy, and the Virtual Boy was a third pillar of Nintendo that you really have rarely seen them try to do since. This this third component 
of their output. I, when the Nintendo DS was first announced, it was infamously marketed as such to try to calm fears that it was replacing oh, yeah. the Game Boy Advance. I definitely Advance. remember yeah. that. And because people loved the GBA, the, the, the Game Boy Advance was this kind of game changer because it was it was the first time I really think the Game Boy... You got a little bit of the Game Boy Color, but the Game Boy Advance really kind of broke barriers as far as, like, who bought it. It wasn't just gamers who bought it. It was businessmen on long flights who bought it. It was... I think it may have also just been like Nintendo trying to reassure because at this time, like we didn't, I think the Nintendo DS, the first thing people were noticing about was the two screen thing, which I think a lot of people might have, like they may have been concerned about people dismissing it as a gimmick and like saying, well, you're, you're getting rid of my Game Boy Advance for this, this thing that I don't Am I even going to like games on this? You're going to stop making them for the Game Boy Advance? Yeah. So infamously on DK Vine, we, we called the Nintendo DS the Nintendo diaper shit because that was super clever. And also because we, we hated everything at that time that didn't appeal. We, we were pretty much a toxic fandom for those, those couple of years. And uh, yeah, Nintendo DS, fuck you. Fuck you. We hate it. We hate it because of reasons. Because our childhood is impro- being properly paid tribute to with this. Nah, nah. N- N- Ninten- Nintendo Wii, more like... Oh, oh, wait. You can't really go downhill from there. I think we probably call it the Nintendo P. The Nintendo, like... The Wii U, did we call it the PU? I don't even... No, because at that point, we... Well, I don't know. No. Um, I don't even think the Wii had a derogatory nickname by that point. Because we were so beaten down by our own neg- negativity, we just didn't care at that point. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we were pretty hard on the DS, but that's the way it was marketed, because people were legitimately concerned about the GBA re- being replaced, and Nintendo said, no, no, this is a third pillar, we're still gonna s- completely support the GBA, that was a lie, Cameron, the GBA was almost immediately usurped by the DS, and it didn't really matter once we got our hands on the DS, because the DS- two, two pillars can still hold up the column. <laughs> <It's-> <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I I love the GBA, and I think I I love the GBA's output more than the DS, the the game's library in general. But uh, you know, I understand why the why there's no room for both. Of course, the DS was a replacement for the GBA, um, and I understand why it had a GBA slot. Yeah, and I understand why yeah. they like try to calm people down. I I do, but it I, they. <laughs> Well, it it was what it was. There was no room for a third pillar. The DS, like the G, there were still GBA games after the DS came out, but it didn't last long. Just like there, it didn't last long for the Super Nintendo with the Nintendo sixty four. It, it very quickly supplanted it. But the Virtual Boy, on the other hand, the Virtual Boy was a third pillar for as briefly as it lasted, because. <sighs> The Virtual Boy was different, Cameron. The Virtual Boy was unlike what was being offered. And that was exciting. Because it didn't have to be as powerful as the home console. It didn't have to be as portable as a handheld. It kind of played by its own rules. And while that may have been limiting, it being so outside of the box made it, I think, all the sadder that nobody wanted it. Because it, it could be... It could be weird it 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 didn't have to tick all these boxes it didn't have to have these checks for what it was it could just be hey here's this third nintendo system over here doing something completely different but but it, it's okay because we still have the game boy we still have our our home console super nintendo and then it, nintendo ultra 64 so it doesn't matter at least that's the way i viewed it but um obviously it, it the, doesn't matter uh oh it doesn't matter Right, the the market didn't really agree with that assessment. So, you know, Cameron, as different as Chad and I are as people and, and in our personalities, one of the reasons we became friends is where our interests intertwined in our personal Venn diagram. And a large part of that is our similar taste in gaming. You know, it shouldn't be a surprise that we were two of the only people who absolutely adored the Virtual Boy. Uh, and that's why we kind of advocated... For it, uh, from the get-go on DK Vine, you know, uh, a series, a shared continuity that had no games for the Virtual Boy. So it, it's it's funny to me that we would always, like, talk about the Virtual Boy. That would be one of the few non-DKU areas 
that we would constantly like champion. That that's despite the fact that we launched the site in 1999 and the Virtual Boy was dead and a laughing stock for two and a half years by that point. And the weirdest thing is, I feel like the Virtual Boy has. Like, always subconsciously bled itself into the site design of DK9. Oh, ab- absolutely it has. Like, from 2004 to 2010, our our website was basically influenced by the Virtual Boy. And the site has always been black with white text, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, Virtual Boy is heavy in black. And honestly, even our current layout, um, even though... I don't think either of us were like consciously thinking about the virtual boy when we came up with this idea. We were just going for like the um, quintessential mid 90s um, ad campaign with rock music and a shaky text on the screen. Yeah, I I have in front of me what the box to the virtual boy looked like (laughs) and it is strikingly like the um, distilled form of everything I just talked about. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I I think... Like, it it looks like a Capri Sun ad. Um, The the Virtual Boy was basically kind of like... And I think it's the the only Nintendo system that doesn't have, like, an air of professionalism about it on its box. This is... This is an adrenaline junkie style box. Yeah, the, the Virtual Boy really, when you come down to it, it's it's basically the psychic residue of uh, the the mid nineties. It is basically the mood slime that that had bubbled up from underneath the surface and uh, and influenced the behavior of Nintendo gamers for several months until the Ghostbusters came in and I don't know shot it back into the painting. You, you you weren't sleeping with your Virtual Boy, were you, Hyle? So, I, I have fallen asleep under the Virtual Boy, I, I have to say. Because uh, it was marketed like you could uh, wear it with a strap around your head, which there was actually no strap and they never released one. But I would try to replicate that imagery by like laying down with it atop my head so I didn't have to use the, uh, the kickstand, which even when you were a kid, you kind of had to hunch over... And it probably contributed to my poor posture, which is why I want you to walk on my back so much right now, Cameron. I I kind of get the impression that they might have, like, gone all in on the stand and not just let you wear it on your head out of safety concerns. Because somebody would definitely try to walk around with that thing on their head. Oh, absolutely. fall down the stairs. And there's also the concern... hit somebody. There's also the concern about uh, affecting your eyesight, which... I, I really despise the meme that, oh, the Virtual Boy makes you go blind. Just give you hairy palms, too, you fucking hacks. You've never played it. All I'm saying is you won't go blind with the Virtual Boy. You use automatic pause. You walk away. You will have a golden eye. Still. But, uh, you're supposed to take breaks. And, of course, like the Chad cop, too, he, he would never, like... He would, he would never take those suggestions and, and use automatic pause to, like have a five minute eye eye break. I always viewed it as, oh thank God I can I can like go get a drink or I can go to the bathroom. It was really I feel like all all games should have automatic pause built into it. That that way when we're playing Sea of Thieves and we're streaming it, I, it doesn't have to be those awkward moments where I go on a bathroom break and my my pirate just starts dancing on the ship. Uh it would just be, oh automatic pause. Let's all take a break. Like it it's democratic that way. The more I think about it, though, about why the Virtual Boy appealed to both Chad and myself, and the more I realize why we were both ensnared by its cord and Proto N64 claw controller, a la the the one Virtual Boy commercial, and that's atmosphere and immersion. So, we're Donkey Kong Country fans, Chad and I, and one of the biggest hooks of the DKC series, but especially that first game, was... Making the world of Donkey Kong Island seem as real and plausible as anything we had ever played in gaming up until that point. Because sure, it was cartoony. It's, it started a bunch of talking animals who, who rode around with googly-eyed animals. But it still felt like it could be taking place somewhere on our planet. There, there was this certain restraint in the design for the game that... that really, really made you buy into it. Part of that was just the 
I guess the limitations of the ACM graphics, but that that really helped build this this world. And, and there was world building in the game as well. And and this this level of logic and plausibility into everything, including how the most of the platforms in the game worked, that uh, it, it really made you feel like you were in this world, you were on Donkey Kong Island. And the music of David Wise and Eveline Fisher really, really helped sell that, too. That Especially that first game, that atmospheric, new-agey, almost minimalistic music, uh, especially the music of Eveline, uh, more so than Wise, I think, really, like, made you feel like you were in a cave or, or in a mine shaft or, or in a temple, you know? There was a very, like, um, consistent use of sound samples that sounded like they could have been coming from the environment rather than an instrument and kind of building up to a melody. And I feel like that really helped cement um, the atmosphere of the environments as you went along. Absolutely. Meanwhile, the Virtual Boy was a system that was kind of, by default, built on immersion. And, and I, I mean, it's promised in the name of the console, the Virtual Boy, sure, but it, it didn't provide a real VR experience like like is thought of today, or even that was you know really like hyped in the early '90s when VR was first invented and, and bandied about as the future of gaming. Oh no! Every everybody thought that you'd end up with something strapped to your face. Yeah, and that was the logical conclusion of the gaming industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I remember in the early 90s, every, you know, seeing all this stuff that VR w- was the wave of the future that, you know, by the end of the decade, we would all be in virtual reality and that, you know, the, the, the traditional console wouldn't exist anymore. But but the Virtual Boy wasn't that. It was basically a budget poor man's version of VR. And, and of course, it, the red and black palette was a big factor in not in not providing a real VR experience, but it was basically just playing traditional games in a new way. And it's, it's an experiment that I will admit did not totally work, but it could have uh, had the developers developing for it understood those limitations and played to them. And that's why I think the most successful Virtual Boy games, the ones that we wax nostalgic for to this day really understood what they were doing with the Virtual Boy, what the Virtual Boy was, and didn't try to play by a different rule book. It was like, okay, so these are these are what we're doing. This is what we're doing with the Virtual Boy. It's a red and black system strapped to your face. We can't do anything totally elaborate with it. How can we make this a cool experience? So you get games like Galactic Pinball that really, really work. But Cameron... I, You've been awfully quiet uh, while I've been going on and on about the Virtual Boy. The Virtual Boy it really has been like pushed by DK Vine for 20 years now as something that everybody ought to try. And we've we've actually made Virtual Boy fans out of lots of people, including fellow staffers. What are your opinions on the Virtual Boy? Uh, when was the first time you ever played it? So uh, I have a confession to make. Uh... Get, get get your angry letter pens ready, the, the, the nice bright red ones. So the thing is, I completely missed out on the Virtual Boy. Never got a Virtual Boy. I didn't get back, get, didn't get back, uh, one back then, and uh, I still don't have one. Um, at the time, I'm sure, like, there were times when I would have been able to get a virtual boy like second hand or like it, it was completely off my radar when it was new because I did not have a Super Nintendo until 1996 when I got one as a gift. Mm. And that was when the Super Nintendo itself was out was going out the door. Back then, I probably would have had reservations buying another video game console because I was a self-conscious kid and I'm like, okay, if I if I buy this thing that is going to take up space in the living room and then I won't be able to as easily persuade my parents to let me get an N64 later or a GameCube because they'll just say, well, you already got a console in the last however many years it's been and you barely touch it. 
So, um, yeah, the Virtual Boy kind of flew off my radar until it got to the point of being prohibitively expensive for me to just impulse buy. Yeah, I, I lucked out because I got it uh, when it was already discontinued, essentially, by Nintendo, although they weren't saying as much. And it well, like went on, cl- like, not clearance, but it was deeply discounted, uh, I think, it was the summer of 96. Um, yeah, I, I was out with my dad and basically I, I had like money saved up, but I convinced him to like spring in for the rest. And uh, yeah, I've got a virtual boy that day. And uh, and then because Blockbuster was discontinuing their rentals for for uh, the virtual boy, I was able to pick up a ton of virtual boy games dirt cheap from them. So uh yeah, it, it, like, worked out. I just realized, like, because I also got from Blockbuster the uh, carrying case that my Virtual Boy is still into this day. It's like a briefcase with the Virtual Boy logo on it. And I just realized, like, that is the most fucking mid-90s thing I can say. Oh, yeah, I got my Virtual Boy in a case from Blockbuster. That That is just, like, so hardcore... 1995. Look out for uh, hot child Hal Russell's cameo in the new Captain Marvel movie. So speaking of mid-90s, I'm going to go grab a pack of Gushers. So uh, it's time now for our automatic pause break. So everybody can uh, rest your eardrums because I don't want, don't want you to go deaf listening to this podcast. So this is our automatic pause break while I go get a pack of my favorite mid-90s snack, Gushers brand fruit snacks. Be right back. And we're back. I hope everyone enjoyed their automatic pause. I uh, hope, hope you got the urine out of your system. Hope you got a snack. Uh, you got a new drink. Uh, I got a pack of fruit gushers. I don't know if this is strawberry or tropical. I won't know until I open it here. Let's see. Hopefully it's tropical because that would be more apropos for DK Vine and the conversation. If I can actually open it here. Do you, do you like gushers, Cameron? Well, I have had Gushers, unlike a Virtual Boy. Okay, so what are your opinions on... How, how you, will need, you will need to explain to me and the audience why I'm on this episode. Okay, I will in a second. Let me just enjoy... It's, it's tropical. It's tropical Gushers. Every, let me enjoy this. Del- oh, man. But one of the Gushers already gushed in the packet, and now there's, like, Gusher juice. It's the one downside to Gushers, because I'm a man who's in his 30s, but I still love fruit Gushers. I love them so much. I want to do more than just eat them. I like I I want to squeeze them in my various orifices because that's how my I can't get enough gushers. I could I can eat an entire box of gushers in an hour and I'm still not satiated. The hunger for gushers is real people. It exists and I I can't ever be satisfied. But the one downside to gushers is that sometimes they've they've already gushed. Premature gushing. And and so you've got a very sticky pack of sticky gushers, and that is what I am encountering right now, with with no napkin in sight. To uh, so I'll just have to lick my hands throughout this episode. Mmm, mmm, it's a good gusher. Mmm, all oh, gushers. Oh, oh God, the '90s are amazing. Mmm, God, whole '95. Oh, mmm, mmm, 1995. Okay, so. Cameron, why are you on this episode? I asked you first. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So, (laughs) 
Well, the reason you're on this episode, Cameron, <laughs> is that... I mean, I'm used to being asked why I'm on episodes, but go on. Mm. The question, would Donkey Kong have worked on the Virtual Boy? Probably not, right? Because the Virtual Boy and Donkey Kong Country, while both very atmospheric, both represented very different kinds of experiences and and like vibes. So Virtual Boy really worked when it celebrated a more sci-fi aesthetic. I, I brought up the aforementioned Galactic Pinball, and, and that is like the quintessential game I think of when I think of a Virtual Boy game that worked because you're in space, there's there's all sorts of otherworldly elements, and so the red and black 3D effect coupled with the music really, really helped make you feel like you were in this environment and it's a shame we never got a proper metroid game for the virtual boy besides galactic pinball which samus does appear in or her ship at least because i think a metroid game would have like really really won over a lot of people i i rarely say yeah just just set an entire game underground in like norfair yeah and then you have an excuse for it being dark and red all the time. Well, I, I, I rarely say should have been Metroid in a non-ironic sense, but really, should have been Metroid. What was, especially since, you know, Gunpai, this was his baby, the Virtual Boy. It's, it's just amazing we never got a full-fledged Metroid game, like, out the door at launch for the Virtual Boy. But I mean, if anything would have, like, been comparable to putting on Samus's helmet. It seems like it would have been strapping your face into the virtual. Right, story. exactly. Um, but you know, you brought up like the the isolation that that Metroid presents that that it's known for. And you look at the other Virtual Boy game that worked, Wario Land Virtual Boy, and that that was a game where like Wario was going like underground treasure hunting and the um. Uh, and, all was on uh, rainforest, uh, like Amazon, but with the M switched to a W. I did do the research for this episode, and like you know, and I've I've spent time with Wario Land, and not not a whole lot, but like just in general, I noticed an overarching theme of the archetypes in that game, even though it is very much like. A Wario, it's in the mold of another Wario Land game, but the archetypes are, you know, stuff like a dark jungle, a cave, a temple, also in the dark. Yeah. Like, there's very little embrace of daylight. Yes. Um, And I think that's something I've noticed across every Virtual Boy game I've taken a look at, is that they all, they all thrive on being able to have a dark play field and use that to your advantage. Yeah, and, and like, the the Virtual Boy games don't really work. There was a golf game for the Virtual Boy, which it, it looks like you're golfing at nighttime, but but it, it's it's not. Like, it, it's, it, so, like, there's the immersion falls apart when it doesn't play to the system's strengths. So when you think about what a Donkey Kong game could have looked like for the Virtual Boy... We were initially picturing Donkey Kong Country 2, which was the darkest Donkey Kong game. So, you know, Chad infamously made, like, three mock-ups of what DKC2 on VB look like, would look like back in 2001. And I love these three screenshots. I mean, oh, yeah. I, 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 I have basically, like, I, they, they look so good and, and, like, so on point. And so, like, e- even things like the Brambles... Yeah. You can really buy it as something somebody would have done. Yeah, so e- even things like his mock-up of Bramble Scramble on the Virtual Boy looks, like, just so beautiful. But, of course, you think about, like, the, the roller coasters in Kremland, and you're like, okay, I could I could definitely see Donkey Kong Country 2 working. You know how we, we could have continuity um, spun this if the game actually happened? How's that? Re-experiencing Donkey Kong Country 2 in red and black could have been what happens to Diddy and Dixie on the game over screen in Donkey Kong Country 2. Or, or maybe, I don't know, it's their trauma flashbacks after destroying Crocodile Isle. They, they they relive this in their nightmares, but it's like in this like demonic red and black color scheme. Uh, just like we we uh, fan wank that conquer live and reloaded is just conquer 
uh, reminiscing about the worst day of his life while suddenly, like, changing details in his recollection. But yeah, like, if you're going to do a Donkey Kong game that wasn't Donkey Kong Country 2, I think the only way to make it work would be have it be less, uh, like, jungle-based and more in caves, mines, tombs, interior temples. Like, do what Wario Land Virtual Boy did, and I think you could have a winning formula. And of course, what we would later see in Donkey Kong Country Returns which was uh, like jumping back and forth between the, the background and the foreground, which that game was inspired, weirdly enough, by Warrior Land Virtual Boy in, in that regard. To the point of apparently nearly having a Virtual Boy minecart stage, which is still a really lamentable loss. Well, well I say nearly, there was concept art made there for There was it. concept art of that, and also um, the, the Golden Temple stage, they toyed with the idea of having a Virtual Boy theme stage which weirdly enough looked like super mario brothers 2 in the game that before they added vegetable pooling yeah there, there's definitely some dna of a donkey kong bb in donkey kong country returns but this brings us to the recent revelations and the reason you're on this episode cameron and that is what we have recently come to terms with it's not even really new information but it's new to us uh about what Donkey Kong VB, as we now have to call it, actually was. And it was not Donkey Kong Country 2, contrary to what Leo Loveday said. And and that, that that's just such so disheartening that scribes led me astray that I'm going to have to have another gusher to, uh, to soothe my battered soul. Uh, Cameron, when did this information about what the game actually was first come to light? So, in at least to, as far as I'm aware of, first time this was really brought to modern attention was um, in 2017, a Digital Foundry did, as part of their Digital Foundry retro series, um, a retrospective on Donkey Kong Country and Killer Instinct titled Donkey Kong Country Plus Killer Instinct, a 16-bit CG revolution. Um, it featured a lot of people who worked at Rhythm Time, mostly Platonic employees at this point, um, and discussed a a lot of the history regarding the game itself, and to some extent the the later franchise, and a but a lot of it being from the technical side of it, like going into the SGI workstations, the how they were doing the modeling, um, how they were converting the sprites and how that was different from pixeling just 2D drawings by hand. And included in this conversation, as they started going over um, ways that the franchise continued on from Donkey Kong Country and got converted into all these different forms, um, revisited, such as, you know, the the Land series um, and the later the GBA ports, like all these things that carried forward the pre-rendered style to establish, part of the conversation turned to a very brief foray with the Virtual Boy. Um, in this program, they they brought on Stephen Hurst, um, who is currently the environment art director at Platonic Games. I believe he came on during the development of DKC2, he kind of he explained a little bit more about um, them attempting to bring Donkey Kong Country to the Virtual Boy. He described it as like it sounds like a this did not get very far. Um, that that still that part still rings very true from what was implied by scribes. Yes. Um, describes it as they it never really got off the ground um, because the Virtual Boy just. They they saw the writing on the wall with the Virtual Boy, essentially, by the time they started really seriously thinking about this. It was, like, develop... I think they decided it was development resources they were better better spend elsewhere. Yeah, because by, by the time they would have started on this, it would have already been plain as day that it was a flop in Japan, at least. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, Donkey Kong Country Mania was a thing, but I, I think it wouldn't have saved the Virtual Boy, and it may have actually done damage to Donkey Kong Country as a brand. Maybe, yeah. We'll, we'll never know for sure, but... And I, and I say that not because the game wouldn't have been good, but because it would be something that was 
again, if, like I said, I don't think DKC would have saved the system. Like having a a financial failure as a, as a Donkey Kong game this early in a series might have done it harm. Although, you know, it didn't really harm any other series that was on the Virtual Boy. It's not like oh, no. Mario Clash. Mario and Wario or, ain't going nowhere. Yeah, and Wario, this was still pretty early in the Wario Land brand, and it, it didn't affect it in any way so wario was really riding high in this time along with donkey kong it's like another bit of shared history between the two yeah well considering donkey kong country at one point might have been a a game co-starring wario uh, that that's <laughs> that's just another like weird link between the two now for the the parts of this that kind of skew in a different direction than what we were expected yes um describes the because obviously there's no footage of this. Um, there, there wouldn't be. This was never shown off. This wasn't made public knowledge. To kind of, in what they were messing with with this, which essentially seems like a proof of concept, it's described as they that he took some of the sprites that had been done for the Game Boy version and put them on the Virtual Boy and kind of ended up with what was essentially a, a 3D... Uh, red and black version of DKC. This should have been a big tell back in 2017, but it, it completely flew under our radar like a reverse Perry the Parallel Bird. Why was that, Cameron? Well, part of it was, I think, just the implicit trust in scribes. Um, in scribes we trust. Yep, I have that tattooed on my taint. Like, well, well, this doesn't quite line up, but, you know, maybe, maybe somebody, somebody's memory is spotty. Maybe the details don't quite line up. Or maybe this was a completely separate project. And yeah, another thing was this is this is a very, very small... Like, I, I feel like I remember watching this entire retrospective when it came out because it's very good. I recommend watching it. Mm-hmm. But this is like, I think like a 40 something minute retrospective. And this segment takes up maybe two minutes of that. Right. Yeah, I just checked. It's 47 minutes and 20 seconds. Well, and considering, you know, Scribes explicitly said it's not Donkey Kong Country. It was Donkey Kong Country 2. Like flat out said that. Uh, I, I think we were able to r- rationalize what was said here as... They took assets from Donkey Kong Land, but they were still building a version of Donkey Kong Country 2 somehow. Like, I don't know how that works w- without and, fixing And, you know, but... the history of Donkey Kong Country 2 was much more nebulous, I think, for some of us, or at least it's in relationship to the development of this game. Like, oh, you know, maybe they were maybe they were toying with this and it was like a different vision of Donkey Kong Country 2 at this point. Yeah, like who 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 knows? I don't know. I'm, ma- I'm making excuses at this point. Well, th- but, but that, that's how that's how it kind of flew under the radar because I feel like most people who heard this would have made those excuses because we have it in writing way back in August 2001. You know that that this was Donkey Kong Country 2, and and I know you know 9/11 changed everything, but it couldn't have changed this. Red and black doesn't melt optic nerves. What happened? Like, what, like, what was Lee just misremembering? I, I know there, there, there was a shorter gulf of time between 1995 and 2001 than there was is 2001 to this day, but it, it, ju- it's just like what, what? I mean, in the window between 1994 and 1997, Rare released six Donkey Kong Country games. True. Yeah. So it might be a little bit <laughs> hard to nail down the timetable for one that they only fooled with for a few months. Th- this this would have continued to be under our radar and, and and not really like affecting our viewpoint of what Donkey Kong VB was. Had uh, I not made a tweet the other week uh, about this, so I've been running a series on the DK Vine Twitter page for a while now, uh, just intermittently called hashtag DKU facts just basically sharing obscure continuity or some game development facts uh, in the tradition of supper Mario broth uh, but but from a DKU perspective right so a lot of the early ones were just designed to kind of show off the the structure of the Donkey Kong universe to kind of show people hey there's these links between Donkey Kong and Banjo you might not have realized uh, m- stuff mostly forgotten about by later, later generations of gamers who didn't grow up with this, 
or like, who, like the fact that Nintendo once used to hold the rights to Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, which was very controversial. Like that that's really what like got the the series a lot of eyeballs uh was that and i like shared the the copyright information from like the diddy kong racy manual and people were still like no no that, that's that's not right i'm like Ugh. anyway that's exactly the way it happened i, I tweeted Ugh. um <laughs> so uh that, that was my very very articulate defense of the history but um yeah so i i just basically like Design this to basically educate uh, people who have been outside of the DK Vine or the the tighter rare fan community bubble, um, and, and kind of bring them into the fold a bit. But um, last week, um, when Nintendo announced the new kind of headset device for the Nintendo Labo, and everybody was making Virtual Boy jokes because I saw Virtual Boy trending on Twitter, and I'm like, excuse me, why is it trending on Twitter? Like, I I got my hopes up that like there's going to be some sort of like virtual boy classic or something, you know? Uh, but no, nah, it's because of, because of this thing and everybody's making virtual boy jokes. So I was like, well, Hey, and that would be a great time for a hashtag DKU facts about DKC two virtual boy. Uh, you know, that it had been a development and it didn't get far, not, not far beyond the title screen. And just basically sharing this common belief taken from August, 2001 scribes, and and kind of shed some new light on it. So uh, I even grabbed one of uh, Chad's old mock-ups of uh, DKC2 Virtual Boy, the Bramble Scramble one that's been on DK Vine for all these years, and I, I shared it on Twitter, hashtag DKU facts. And uh, then I went to bed. And uh, not long after, uh, <laughs> Paul uh, Makachek, who I mostly associate with his role on It's Mr. Pants, but I should probably celebrate uh, more as the lead programmer of Donkey Kong Land. Uh, he chimed in with some relevant knowledge. And when I say relevant knowledge, I mean he completely invalidated the entire tweet. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> DKU facts with an asterisk. I didn't know. I was just going off scribes, right? Cameron, would you like to, uh, would you like to read... Or or start to read this this Twitter chain. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip the actual chain of conversation because I feel like it it would it's not necessary here no. and not really necessary to contextualize um, a few days ago as opposed to two thousand one. But um, like but Cameron, in in eighteen years, this will be the new two thousand one. Wow. So that's a trip. That's a thing to say to somebody when they're staring at the uh, red and black sunset mock-up that Chad made. Yeah, yeah. Because feels very, very feels very cosmic. Because Chad replied with because I I posted the bramble scramble mock-up and he replied to the uh, the the ending mock-up he did of them staring at the ocean, which I I also equally love. But uh, you know, to to really sell the concept, I I posted the bramble scramble because a lot of people were making jokes that it looked like raw meat. Or, and I, I said it looked like my uh, circulatory system, but uh, pe- people. And also, you didn't want to you didn't want to spoil the ending no! of the imaginary DKC two virtual. Exactly, boy. yeah. Spoiler alert, please. <laughs> Can I just say, people are so mean to the Virtual Boy aesthetic. People who have not played it, they look at these screenshots and they're like, "Ah, my eyes." I'm like, "Shut up! You haven't played it. Shut up." Anyway, uh, Paul's response. Uh, I'm actually the person who worked on this. I did it for three months and was cross-eyed with headaches by the end. I implemented a simple horizontal scrolling jungle background with split-level platforms and DK running around being DK, in quotes. All art was pre-rendered and lifted from DKC. I I replied, oh my god, the most we've ever had to go on this was an answer... Lee Loveday gave in the Scribes letter column back in the day. He said it was a version of DKC2. And you didn't want to give out his Twitter handle so people don't yell at him after this episode. Right, right. Like, he can't hide behind Scribes anymore. He's just got Twitter like the rest of us. So, you know, I, I don't want the angry letters to start coming. He hasn't responded to this, by the way. So I'm sure he, he's won- he's been wondering the last week or so, how did this happen? How was I so wrong? Just like, I, I was just feeling awful about that uh, incorrect statement I made about Nick's feature on DK Vine, 
I'm sure he's feeling this too, and he's going to have to issue a correction somewhere, but he's just trying to make, make sense of it because his world doesn't make sense anymore. I, I'm sure that's what's going on. Uh, anyway, so I, and I said, you know, this whole notion is one of my holy grails and you're the weird knight Templar looking at me, looking at me disapprovingly, which I, I think, I don't think he got that reference right away. Uh, <laughs> cause I, I was picturing the end of last crusade when the, the temple was collapsing because they took the grail over the line and, and he, the, 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 the knight was just like, tisk tisk. My whole life is, is, has been wasted. Anyway, so the conversation continued, and he said, There was never a decision to a- to actually do a specific DK game. We simply had this hardware from Big N and wanted to see if there was mileage in it. It was to use pre-rendered art, and the DK stuff was the most logical source. And I, I think the fact that this was a proof of concept with no specific, like, outline for a game may be one of the reasons that it was kind of nebulous like is this donkey kong country is this donkey kong country 2 because it's as a proof of concept following on from donkey kong country and donkey kong land it's like kind of nominally a donkey kong country sequel which would make it a version of donkey kong country 2 yeah kind of um i mean it's as much as a donkey kong country 2 as Donkey Kong Land was a Donkey Kong Country 2, but um, it, it, it was concurrent with dkc 2s development. And I, I, re- I tweeted this and then like I got in discussion with Paul because he couldn't remember if it was actually concurrent with dkc 2s development. And then he checked Wikipedia and he realized it was. It's, it's so funny to me that like this is this stuff is basically like very, very important history that we study. But to the people making it who are there, you know, it's... It's just, it's just life, you know, it doesn't hold the same kind of mythical proportions that we, we hold it up as. So, the, you know, for, for him, it was Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it kind of cracks me up just the, the perspectives there. But uh, yeah, so it was concurrent with DKC2's development, but utilize art assets from the first game or, or what it's more utilize it, assets from Donkey Kong Land. Which in, were, in his follow up, um, it sounds like they were they were probably assets from Donkey Kong Land because it sounds like they figured, well, the the work of converting them over to a four-color palette is already done. Yeah, but, I mean, the assets from Donkey Kong Land were assets from Donkey Kong Country, Which, so it's just, you know... Yeah, it's just transitive property. Right, right. Um, but um, I, I have to say, um, I don't know if that's actually what they did or if there's more to it than that, and, they're under, and uh, Paul and Steven are underselling their efforts, but... If that's what happened, I kind of feel like that may have been part of the reason for those headaches. Because as we described earlier, um, the Virtual Boy, I feel like, is optimal for games that go for... that try to make the play field dark and contrast that with um, light, uh, foregr- uh, light foreground elements for contrast... And like that's why again, night environments, space, abstract 3D all thrive. The Game Boy, on the other hand, um, people weren't working around the fact that you were dealing with a very, very bright red that you kind of had to notch back for people in order for it not to be fatiguing to your eye. They were working with the opposite problem where they're working with four color um, grayscale, black and white, through a system displaying it all in like what could charitably be described as like a booger green with no backlight. So games were kind of designed to. They thrived under kind of the opposite conditions of the Virtual Boy, which is you wanted the play field to be as light as possible yeah. and have foreground elements that were dark to contrast against that and just have your characters be the th- your thing that stood out. Infamously, Donkey Kong Land was not <laughs> the original Donkey Kong Land. Uh, because uh, I, I think to some extent, pre-rendered graphics are... The, the, uh, the Game Boy is not ideal conditions. No, I, when you look at the first Donkey Kong Land and you compare it to the sequels, the sequels definitely scale back the level of detail in the backgrounds. 
uh, almost to an absurd degree. But yeah, the original Donkey Kong Land was nearly unplayable on the Game Boy. Like I said, luckily we had the Super Game Boy at the time, and then the Game Boy Pocket would come out uh, like two years later and would would give you like an, an avenue finally to like play it on the go that was possible because of the greater clarity in the uh screen i would also venture to guess that um a lot of the reason like donkey kong land still looks fine you know in in still shots um is that people like don't get me wrong it's still pretty fine put, put together game but i think it holds up better because People remember, people had context for what Donkey Kong Country looked like. Yeah. So you could see a screenshot from Donkey Kong Land that saps way more color out than had to be sapped out from the 3D models converted into 2D sprites that use only 16 colors. And your mind can fill in the blanks like, okay, that vaguely looks like Donkey, that vaguely looks like a slip up. And I know that. If this were a color game, it would look this much larger. It would be red. It would be black. It would have white stripes. Yeah, and by the way, this is why you're on this episode, Cameron, because we're talking about art assets. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so uh, where I was going with this was, so I feel like if you were to just take a screenshot from Donkey Kong Land and convert it directly like do a one-to-one -one translation of the game boy palette and the virtual boy palette and i say if you were to do this because i absolutely did it myself um to see what would happen you kind of end up with a i want to say obnoxious looking screen with a like a blight, bright blood red sky that like has no like, like just just bright red um a lot of like high contrast foreground that's difficult to see your character next to um at times like i think it would have definitely not been the ideal as a one to one conversion you would think it would that sort of thing would be viable for a virtual boy to game boy or the other way around translation just because they're both systems that use a four color display yeah. But it it's really not, I don't think. Well, again, like I, I think the fallacy would be trying to recreate a Donkey Kong country jungle on the Virtual Boy. Had they created new backgrounds, had like like Donkey Kong Land, you look at Donkey Kong Land, where it did succeed were in the newer environments, like the the ship the get gangplank galleon or Big Ape City. They didn't do Absolutely they didn't do overkill there. And, then, and and this is something that would have come up in development yes. had the game gone on, surely. The, any, any, like, headaches it caused in development would have just not been an issue had they progressed with it. And had they gone the Wario Land uh, v, VB route with, you know, uh, more underground stages and and changing up the vibe and the atmosphere then you wouldn't have this garish mess that you've so faithfully recreated. In, uh, so I want to thank you for that. I now have a new Donkey Kong VB image to stare at. A new screenshot after all these years. I have a fourth fictional screenshot to fantasize about what could have been. So thank you, Cameron. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking about all that, like, I just realized how I have this image in my head of how miserable QA testing Virtual Boy games must have been with people having to shove their faces in and out of the display over and over and over again. They would have had to have definitely had people walking on their backs at all hours of the day. Um, I, I need to point out, though, the weird little trivia bit that uh paul makachek threw in here about what the enemies running around this jungle oh stage yeah were. this this contextualizes something that's very odd in the the mock-up i created that yeah. people might clue into so you're thinking you know oh don't go country assets so surely they had like critters and naughties what what enemies did they have in there they had uh, rats from off of Battletoads. Right, which which Paul Makachek also worked on. So it makes sense. And it's... Yeah, spe specifically, this was just... They needed... I think he... 
like again, proof of concept. See if this can work. Um, the Game Boy, the assets for the Game Boy Battletoads were just available. Slotted them in real quick. There's your enemy. Yeah. It, it's something for DK to jump on. It doesn't intrinsically make a statement about what a Donkey Kong Country game on Virtual Boy would be like for a proof of concept because they're just something for him to jump on. It's amusing to me, though, given the incorrect assumption that so many people have that the Kremlings were created for a Battletoads game to then actually, for this brief window of time, have an actual honest-to-God Battletoads enemy in a Donkey Kong game, even one that never got far in development, and even one that was just a placeholder enemy. It's still amusing to me that, yeah, at one time Donkey Kong did fight a Battletoads enemy, just not what you're thinking about. And it's funny, be- like because Twitter is sometimes very unintuitive to read. I ended up seeing a reply where he talks about Donkey Kong jumping on rats first, and thinking, "Oh wow, did so did were they did did Paul like pull Neeks from off of uh, Donkey Kong Country two at the, at this point in time and right. put them in the game." <laughs> and and, and then, then you're like, "Oh, so Lee saw the Neeks and thought, oh, it's Donkey Kong Country 2. And, uh, yeah, no. No, it, it it's Battletoads assets. Yeah. In in the reply chain, um, asked him, like, it, is, is this still around? Like, does this exist? Can I play this? Uh, and uh, he kind of, again, reiterated it, just a proof of concept, didn't really do anything. Um, obviously, it did something, but, you know, they. I don't think this would have been something that where it would keep like that would be the, a file on somebody's desktop to pry open and shove into a virtual boy emulator. So wait, e- even if I offer him money, he won't send me the cartridge and 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 let me play it. I promise I won't resell it, Cameron. <laughs> so yeah, Paul just to to satiate the imagination posted a couple of screenshots of Donkey Kong Land um the the first level of it screenshots taken from the internet of it running on the Super Game Boy which just means they have a like pale green yellow filter over them because the Super Game Boy only rendered each level in a single color mm-hmm. yeah um he said imagine these images in various shades of red with some rats running around DK that's pretty much what it looked like well i could see honestly that thing gave me a neck ache as well come to think of it yeah but hey, that's enough for us to create an entire podcast episode around. So thank you, Paul. Uh, so let, let's wrap this up, Cameron. Uh, th- this is a follow-up to a season three episode, which was based around a long-standing assumption about what this project was. Uh, obviously, the Virtual Boy looms large in the hearts of the DK Vine staff. And having a Donkey Kong game, even if it's a project that never got far and never had any chance of actually ever being completed, having that at one time be on the system is basically one of the holy grails, like I said, of DK Vine. One one of these like dream projects that we, we will always fantasize about, but we always fantasized it as Donkey Kong Country 2. Before Lee's comment... The Virtual Boy Donkey Kong game I always dreamt of was a game called Swanky's Virtual Disco because I just imagined, hey, what would be a good Donkey Kong character to anchor the Virtual Boy? Why Swanky Kong, of course. So I I had this like weird game in in my head that I fantasized about before I even owned a Virtual Boy. Like, I need to get a Virtual Boy because I'm sure they're going to do a Swanky Kong game. Based on you it. know, it's it's funny you say this because I was thinking about this before we did the episode, and I was trying to imagine. Okay, well, what could a Donkey Kong game on the Virtual Boy do that wouldn't just be like a watered down or like so- sideways version, like you know, tri- take the good with the bad version of what DK- DKC already does? Yeah, and something that. I realized was, well, Swanky's bonus games in DKC3 would have been something the Virtual Boy could do and add actual depth to. Absolutely, yeah. So, there you go. Hey, we could still make this happen, Cameron. I I still believe in Swanky's Virtual Disco. 
Uh, but yeah, for, for almost 18 years, we have been associating this game as Donkey Kong Country 2. So does this new info dampen our, our faux nostalgia for Donkey Kong BB? And, and for me, I would say after some careful consideration weighing this over the last week or so, I, I would say no. It actually makes me more invested in this fake project. And, and here's why. So, I've never been completely on board with the idea of remakes in general. Like, the Game Boy Advance Donkey Kong Country games are fine for what they are, and I, I love a great deal about them and what they contributed to the series, but if it was up to me, those wouldn't be remakes. Those would be brand new games, you know. But but we, we couldn't get that, and it was just nice to have Rare still be involved with Donkey Kong well into the buyout years, so, you know, whatever. But it's it's like pulling a thread on an expertly woven tapestry that that's what a remake is to me because it's never going to look the same it's never going to feel the same and and you keep pulling on that thread and it's just going to ruin it eventually and it doesn't matter how much at the very least it it certainly couldn't have um on the, the the gba hardware like it's i think it is ultimately a good thing that those ports existed because they made the games available for people who you know may not have had a super nintendo may have been too young to have a super nintendo maybe just weren't into video games at the time like um a lot of modern day donkey kong country fans and many of them well into 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 their adult years at this point started with donkey kong country with the Don- the game boy advance versions oh yeah look I, I i'm not like castigating them or throwing shade those games were the torchbearer for the Donkey Kong Country brand at a time when we needed somebody to carry but that torch. So I wouldn't call them like um like if video games had a criterion collection, these would not be the versions of the Donkey Kong Country games you would consider definitive in no. the slightest. And, and you know this, this debate has come up even even now when people like want you know HD remakes of the Banjo Kazooie games. Uh, you know that that aren't the XBLA versions, and I, I'm just like you know, I, I I I always want something new with the characters I love. So long as the old games are readily available, and Donkey Kong Country Two, of course, is my favorite game of all time. So having a Virtual Boy remake, as much as I love the Virtual Boy, as much as I love Donkey Kong Country Two, I I never was never quite sure whether or not it would have been a good idea for there to have been a remake of DKC2 on the Virtual Boy so early in the series. And I know Donkey Kong Land 2 was just a remake of Donkey Kong Country 2, but at the very least, you know, it had the Donkey Kong Land branding and we we could, you know, we could build it as its own thing. I Um, I would venture to guess the love was more for the idea of Donkey Kong country as a series on the virtual boy than the specifically it being dkc2 yeah and, and so the more i've been thinking about this since this revelation i having a new ish donkey kong adventure that reuses assets a la donkey kong land would have been ideal for virtual boy maybe, maybe not a jungle stage but you know give dk and diddy a new adventure with familiar aesthetics and some some that are wholly unique to this game its own, you know, Big Ape City or, or Cloud Levels or whatever, you know, it, it could have been considered this underground classic, n- no pun intended there, uh, much along the same lines of what some of the other games DK Vine adores, like like Paul McJack's It's Mr. Pants, you know, a game that not many people would have ever played, surely, but we would have loved all the more because it would have been like this secret handshake between us, like, oh yeah, Donkey Kong Virtual Boy. All right, you're my friend. <laughs> I mean, it, I'm trying to think what the like logical third pillar is between country and land as far as name convention conventions go, because I feel like that's what the name of the theoretical Donkey Kong Country for Virtual Boy would have had. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, and the Virtual Boy was never around to really develop that kind of naming scheme, like. Land was just basically the shorthand that was derived from Super Mario Land, and so like port. I mean, we have v- Virtual Boy Wario Land. It's doesn't really work. Yeah, Donkey Kong Clash. <laughs> I uh, no, no, that doesn't work. Uh, 
Donkey Kongo boxer? No, that's that's rubbish. Uh, Donkey Kong Golf? Oh no, that's Jungle Beat. Yeah, it doesn't really work with any other Virtual Boy games, but Donkey Kong Inner Earth or something. I don't know. Uh, I, that would be good. Uh, Donkey Kong Country Journey to the Sun of the Re-Earth. Yeah, that yeah, way. yeah. There, yeah that, there, there's your dark background. There you go, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I, I think like this information and, and your mock screenshot has gotten me more excited about this project than it was just when it was just Donkey Kong Country 2, or at least in our heads, was just Donkey Kong Country 2. Uh, the downside of that would be it would be damn near impossible to play nowadays. You know, when you consider that even games like Diddy Kong Racing, like the one, one, the biggest N64 game of the holidays 97, you can't even play it legally nowadays unless you have an N64 with the original cartridge. You know, it would be a shame to have one more part of our childhood that's basically lost to the current generation. It, it would be even worse with the Virtual Boy than it would be for... A, a game like Diddy Kong Racing 2 because like there's nothing really in there's nothing that different um that I can think of that you'd encounter um playing Diddy Kong Racing like on an emulator versus playing it on the actual hardware like I feel like having your face in it and having the 3D effect which I'd imagine like, I just can't figure out many ways accessible to every consumer that you would be able to package that for people. The closest thing I could think of that, and I take the, fa the fact that they did this, didn't do this as a sign that Nintendo is just never going to ever do anything to revisit the Virtual Boy, was put them on the 3DS Virtual Console and yeah. use that 3D. Yeah, yeah. And that I feel like if there was ever a time to do something with the Virtual Boy that would have been it. You know, I've got my red and black 3DS right here on the desk, my desk still, and uh, I fully anticipated one day I would get to play Galactic Pinball on it. But even playing a Virtual Boy game on the 3DS, that wouldn't have been the same. Like, so much of the Virtual Boy was that immersion. Putting that foam visor around your head and having the outside world completely shut off and and the smell of the foam and it just it, it it really transplanted you into another world and and yeah so it, it's very much uh software that is tethered to the console or, or the system it was on and yeah it, it, it's a shame that we're probably never going to get that experience that's why like this this headset with with the labo was like being People were talking about the Virtual Boy because, hey, you could you could maybe port the Virtual Boy games with this, but you know, I, I don't think it's ever going to happen, or at least it it won't happen for for several more years. I, I mean, maybe when Nintendo actually chases VR uh, for realties and and they develop a, a their own their own headset or whatever, um, maybe then we'll we'll get the Virtual Boy games back. But I don't know. Um, but I, I think, you know, ha having that secret game uh, among the, the DKU faithful would still be uh, charming and, and we would still celebrate it today. Like we celebrate Donkey Kong Land today. Not many people play the Donkey Kong Land either, um, but we, we still or definitely... Conker's Pocket Tales. Conker's Pocket Tales, but we still talk about hogwashes and acorn people, much to the alienation of our audience. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, it, it, it's been surprising to to find out that what we long believed was wrong. Uh, but you know, part of growing as, as people is is realizing that you don't know it all, and that you you know you, you're still figuring it out up until the moment of your death. And you know that's part of being a well-rounded person. You've got to admit when you're wrong, and and grow from it, and and just become more knowledgeable well-rounded person as a result and i looking at it like that i can't wait for more of our long-held assumptions about canceled projects to blow up in our face so maybe in a couple months we'll find out that saberman stampede was more of a backwards retreat this has been a file two production sorry about your friends scarn the joke's on you golden face that man was a wanted animal rapist